I want to welcome you guys to today's webinar on TCPA compliance. I'm Mary Hart, the Senior Marketer at Connect Leader. First, a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available after the webinar. If you have any questions for our panelists during the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. To ask a question, please click on Q&A at the bottom of the screen and enter your question in the box there. I'll be collecting any questions that come in to ask. Now, let's get to our webinar. We are here to learn why sales leaders need to worry about TCPA compliance. And today's panelists are Paul Gibson and Michael Greenlee. Paul Gibson is the Director of Marketing Compliance Services at Compliance Point. He is focused on US and international direct marketing compliance regulations. He works with clients in a variety of industries and is dedicated to providing reliable and practical consulting services. Michael is a business and technology transactional attorney. Over the past 24 years, he has served as legal counsel to emerging growth technology companies. Prior to his legal career, he served in various roles in the engineering, regulatory, and procurement organizations of Bell South Telecommunications, Inc. Today, they'll be discussing the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, otherwise known as TCPA, as well as a common misconception about TCPA in the industry. We're glad to have you both here, and I'm going to turn this over to Michael to get started by telling you just what TCPA is. Well, thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a transactional attorney, and, and my context in dealing with the TCPA is to assist clients in review of contracts where the TCPA may be implicated. Um, in connection with that, I thought it'd be good to provide a little bit of overview of uh, the background on the TCPA. It was uh, passed by Congress in 1991 with a purpose of banning automated and pre-recorded telephone calls to uh, protect telephone consumers from nuisance and privacy invasions. Um, now with that, as you can probably imagine, technology was, was uh, much different in 1991 than it is today. And the Federal Communication Commission um, is the governing body that interprets the TCPA. Unfortunately, there are some grammar type uh, anomalies in the TCPA that have resulted in it being a very highly litigious uh, piece of law and a highly litigated piece of law. And uh, you really have to, to monitor the activity of litigation and, and uh, holdings by co various courts um, on a monthly basis. Uh, with that, I'm gonna ask a few questions uh, to our guest, Paul. Um, first of all, Paul, what, what are some common misconceptions about the TCPA that you run across in your compliance review for clients? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, definitely a lot of uh, misconceptions, and, and hello, everyone. Um, you know, happy to be here. Um, what, you know, what I see uh, common misconceptions, it, it, it boils down to really two. Uh, the first one would be that uh, the TCPA doesn't apply uh, to my calls or to my text messages or really even to my company because uh, I've got a relationship with the, the people I'm calling or the people I'm texting. They, they either purchased from me, they, they inquired to my company, um, and therefore the TCPA doesn't apply. And that's just simply not the case. Um, the, the second misconception that, that I see pretty often is the fact that companies that are engaged in business-to-business -business calling think that the TCPA doesn't apply to them as well, that it's only a consumer, um, and hence the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's easy to, to have that misconception. Um, but it does apply to, to plenty of business to business calls and uh, there are plenty of, of rules and, and cases that we'll go through later uh, that, that illustrate that. Well, thank you, Paul. Well, uh, how are auto dialers involved in TCPA? Yeah, good question. Um, when it comes to court cases with the TCPA, auto dialers are, seem to be front and center and, and um, I'll do my best to explain it as simple as possible what an auto dialer is, but just know that not even courts agree on what an auto dialer is. So take that uh, for what you will, but 
kind of in layman's term, what an auto dialer is, is it is a system that has the capacity to dial or text without human intervention. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, human intervention would be if you are clicking a number or you're, you're dialing a number um, or you're clicking send on a text message each time you send it. Now, the, the second factor that we've got to consider is this whole notion of uh, capacity. Uh, so even if you are just clicking a phone number one, one by one, um, that call may still be subject to auto dialer rules. We'll go into what those are. But that call may be subject to auto dialer rules, even if your system just has the capacity to do it, not, not whether or not you use such an automated mode, uh, but whether can you flip a switch or just turn on uh, the auto dialing feature of your calling or texting platform? And if so, then you, you'd want to really treat every call or every text from that platform as if it was placed with an auto dialer. And that also applies to third parties too. So if you've got a company who is calling on your behalf, um, really there's this thing called vicarious liability. And we want to make sure that uh, any third party acting on your behalf is utilizing the correct dialing platform, whether it's an automated dialer or a manual dialer uh, in the appropriate fashion. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. And, and just as, as background for our guests, um, the, the TCPA prohibits calls to cell phones without the express consent of the called party when an automatic telephone dialing system is used to place the call. And that's where we were coming up with the term ATPS. Now, this is where the, the TCPA gets into some trouble and because in, in, which has resulted in it being a highly litigated piece of uh, legislation. The TCPA defines an ATDS as equipment which has the capacity to store or produce telephone numbers to be called. And then it has a comma using a random or sequential number generator and to dial such numbers. Now, where we get into trouble with TCPA is that, and, and unfortunately there's a split among the, the federal circuit courts in the interpretation of this definition of ATDS. And uh, the FCC came out with a, a ruling uh, in 2015 interpreting the definition of ATDS that, that broadly defined it to the extent that a, a a cell phone by the fact that it could download an app to automate calling, therefore the cell phone was an ATDS, which uh, one of the FCC members at the time, who's now uh, since Trump was elected, become the chairman of the FCC, you know, drafted a dissent to that rulemaking in 2015. Um, and uh, so, so as a result of that, there was a uh, DC Circuit Court case in two, 2017 called ACA International that uh, basically threw out all of the FCC's broad interpretation. Okay. Further development in case law since then has resulted in the Ninth Circuit, which is the Western states, including California, the Second Circuit, um, which is New York, and the Sixth Circuit in the last month, which is the Midwest. Um, have interpreted ATDS, ATDS uh, very broadly, okay? We have other circuit courts like the 11th Circuit where I am in Atlanta, Georgia, that have more narrowly uh, defined it. Now, about a month ago, the Supreme Court approved a, um, a, a review of a case involving Facebook and it's anticipated that the Supreme Court will provide some clarity um, on the definition, on the breadth of the definition of ATDS. But the main takeaway from this seminar should be that, um, and I'm sure most of you market throughout the country, okay? So the fact that there's a split among the circuit courts um, creates business risk and uncertainty. And so, um, you know, it, it's important to, to understand that uh, there is some differences in the way courts have interpreted ATDS. Um, with that, I'll move on to our next question for Paul. And that is, how does TCPA compliance apply in the business to business context? 
Yeah, good. Uh, really good. Good outline there, Mike. Uh, and the the TCPA applies to business to business calls mainly when we're using an auto dialer or an automated system to to place calls or text messages. Um, manually dialed calls, uh, whether they're for informational or for sales purposes, are largely exempt from the TCPA for calling business to business. Um, so when, when we're talking about auto dialed calls or text business to business, what we need to be concerned about is consent standards. And so what that means is if you're, if you're making an automated call, automated text, uh, perhaps it's a, a text broadcast or a uh, pre-recorded messages, um, or you're predictably dialing, we need to be worried about cell phones. So if we're calling cell phones using an auto dialer, we need to have what's called express written consent. And if we're doing it for informational purposes, then, and, and we're calling a cell phone uh, for sales purposes, uh, or excuse me, for informational purposes, then we just need to have a relationship with that business cell phone owner. So um, what we want to be concerned about, again, is, is auto dialing cell phones for sales purposes. And the reason that we need to be concerned about that is, one, I mean, it, it's the rule, uh, but two, when we're, when we're talking about cell phones, there's a, there's a bit of gray area, a bit of ambiguity if someone's using their cell phone for business and uh, personal use, or perhaps a business owner of a cell phone uh, cancels that or gets a new number. Um, that's now reassigned to someone else. Um, and now we're auto dialing them. We're sending them a pre-recorded message or we're sending them a, an automated text messages for sales purposes. Uh, that really opens up a, really a, a whole nother can of worms if, if we're going to, um, if we're going to be auto dialing cell phones. So again, if you're, if you're using an auto dialer to call cell phones for sales purposes, you need express written consent. Thank you, Paul. Let me, uh, um, let me slip in an additional question. So when you say automated, um, mm -hmm. in, in your compliance review for companies for TCPA compliance, does that mean that every, well, actually, let me back up a second. You referenced text earlier in your discussion. And uh, I think it's important to clarify that although the TCPA was originally addressed for phone calls, um, the FCC has interpreted the TCPA as applying to text as well. So that therefore, you know, the body of cases that um, relate to the TCPA um, do address um, text as well. But my question is, do you have to have human intervention on each and every call or text that's made to navigate away from um, TCPA, even if you're calling or texting a cell phone? Okay. Would, 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 a, would a human intervention in a call to a cell phone or a human intervention on each and every text, would that navigate you away from the, the scope of TCPA, Paul? Uh that is a question a lot of companies face, and the answer depends on capacity. So if you're using human intervention to call, human intervention to text, we need to make sure that that system that you're using to call or to text doesn't have the capability of automated calls, automated text, meaning calls or texts placed without human intervention. So if we're trying to get away from TCPA, uh, some, of the, some of the TCPA that applies to business-to-business -to -business phone calls, and we're, we're manually dialing, meaning we're using human intervention for dialing, we need to make sure that our system doesn't have the capacity to auto-dial. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, let, let me amplify that a little bit on the capacity question. I, I've, in the cases I've read, and keeping up to speed on TCPA, there seems to be a continuum and disparity in the various circuit courts as to what that capacity enablement means. You know, at one extreme, and this, this falls in line with where the FCC's 2015 rulemaking that was 
thrown out in the uh, ACA international case in 2017 was that that you could, it wasn't just a flip the switch test. It was, you know, if you add an additional program, which is where uh, the dissenting opinion in that 2015 case was coming from as related to cell phones constituting an ATDS, um, you know, some courts have examined the construed, you know, if you hired a team of programmers to modify uh, your existing solution to enable automation, then that could can constitute capacity. Other courts at the other extreme have taken a more practical approach where um, it would be a flipping the switch. But if the flipping the switch is a license capability of the user, um, whether it's used or not, the fact that you had the capability to turn that switch on still meant that your dial outbound dialing system was an ATDS. Um, so, uh, you know, again, the main takeaway point there is that there is a degree of lack of clarity as to what additional uh, hu human intervention is required to enable that, that capacity to, uh, for automation. As we go on to the next question for Paul, what, what could happen to a company if they're not TCPA compliant with their calling? Yeah. the. Uh the the main thing that could occur is it's a class action there are a few other things and i'll go into but a, a class action lawsuit is where uh most of companies that are not compliant with the tcpa that that's where they find the, the area that they'll find themselves in so um just to, to point out some facts uh the the number of, of tcpa lawsuits has increased tenfold over the past decade, um, we're already at about 2,000 lawsuits uh, since January, so year to date uh, in 2020. Um, and the average settlement uh, for a TCPA uh, class action is 6.6 .6 million. Um, so really, when we're talking about what could happen to a company, uh, well, they're going to pay money, and it's going to likely be in the form of a class action. Uh, another way that, that they may uh, have to pay some money for, for violations would be if the FCC were to fine them. Um, the fine amount ranges, uh, but it, it's generally from 500 to 1500 per violation. Um, so what that means is if there are multiple violations on a call, then that violation is going to rack up. So let's say they, they, they find that your, your violations are worthy of $500 per violation. Well, if we call someone on their cell phone uh, with an automated uh, dialing system and we didn't have the proper consent to do so, uh, that could be one violation. But if we're doing it, if we're making uh, perhaps thousands of calls or perhaps we're, we're violating other portions of the TCPA on a single call, uh, those violation amounts start to rack up pretty quickly. And then uh, finally, just public reputation. Um, Really, you, you don't want to find yourself uh, on, on the front page or uh, in, in the news for any reason um, negatively, but um, you definitely don't want to be out there uh, uh, because you got you were subject to a class action lawsuit. You had to settle and, and, and just know that there are people out there uh, that make a living off of uh, trying to, to have companies pay them for, for calls and text messages that they've received. And they go after people who have settled in, in the past or, or they go after companies who have settled in the past. So um, they start to see, okay, this company was obviously caught in the past. Um, that makes them low hanging fruit to what they call professional plaintiffs. Uh, so that's kind of a, when you're looking at pub, public reputation and, and, the, and the damage to that um, followed shortly behind that is the potential for these uh, you know, perhaps ambulance chasers w w might be a uh, a good analogy for it, but they may come after you as well. But in a, in a couple of uh, points to amplify Paul's comments there, um, if, you, if you'd like more information on the statistics relating to uh, TCPA violations, the U.S. Chamber Institute for Legal Reform published a study in August 2017 uh, called TCPA Litigation Sprawl. 
a study of the sources and targets of recent TCPA lawsuits. So if you, and this is this uh, report, which is a, a PDF you can download. And if you just Google uh, TCPA litigation spr sprawl US chamber, you should be able to easily find it. But, but basically what that study did is it, it provides the, the statistics that demonstrate that uh, TCPA litigation has increased tenfold over the, la over the last um, uh, 10 years. And um, it even goes through and lists out the uh, publicly disclosed settlement amounts where like the Caribbean Cruise Line TCPA settlement um, topped the list at 76 million and Capital One Bank settlement uh, at 75 million was the second largest settlement they cited. So, you know, as Paul mentioned, the average settlement is 6.6 .6 million, um, but these numbers get extraordinarily high. Um, as it relates to the, uh, the damages, you know, as an attorney, uh, and if we have any attorneys in the group, um, you know, a lot of times part of your largest burden in a case is to prove your damages. Well, the TCPA is a federal statute that provides for a private right of action. So that, that allows, what that means is that allows, uh, you know, individual plaintiffs to bring a lawsuit under the act. And unfortunately, you don't have to prove your damages under the TCPA. Um, each instance, e each text or phone call to a cell phone that is in violation of the TCPA has a statutory damage of $500 that the plaintiff does not have to prove. All they have to prove is that the violation occurred, each instance. So, you know, in the, in the reported cases, you know, you might, see, you know, 50 unsolicited calls made. Um, that's 50 times 500 as far as damages. And if the uh, violation was done knowingly and willfully, then you have treble damages, which means three times 500. And that's where we get to the $1,500 amount. So um, yeah, these, these numbers can, can result in extraordinarily high amounts. Um, so on to our next question for Paul, for sales leaders, why do they need to care or worry about PCPA compliance? For sales leaders, um, I, I'll, I'll just say in, in general, when I start to work with a company, um, compliance isn't necessarily um, top of mind for, for the sales leaders, for the, uh, the folks in charge of, uh, of making calls and texts, their their job is to sell, right? And, and it's more uh, legal or compliance who, who's going to be responsible for things like getting licenses and making sure uh, that, that scripts have proper uh, disclosures on them, that websites look like this or like that. Um, so really, I, I don't see initially uh, where, where sales leaders are, are often too concerned about compliance, but that shouldn't be the case. And the reason for that is when non-compliance occurs or is found, whether it's hopefully internally before any sort of uh, litigation occurs, oftentimes um, that hinders the ability for sales leaders to do their job. So if, if we've got a, a, a campaign it's out of compliance and, and we find out about it through an audit or, or however the case, odds are uh, legal or compliance is gonna advocate for shutting that campaign down until we get it back into compliance. So that, that's something I see pretty often. So instead, uh, what I often advocate for with, when working with sales leaders is to have kind of a review process in place. Um, and that way, uh, when you want to start a new campaign, uh, buffer in some time to, to run it by legal and compliance. And that way, you're, you're checking the boxes beforehand, and you're not going to have any gaps in, in between your campaigns. Um, and so that way, you can operate as a sales leader as uh, really as efficiently and as often as you desire to do so, as long as it's within the compliance parameters and, and we're not having... Uh, another department advocating for us to pause until we get 
compliance back into place. Thank you, Paul. We had a, a question come in um, from the from John in our audience, uh, more for verification. Hyphen the TCPA compliance only speaks to mobile numbers, correct? And uh, that is not exactly correct. And and I'll I'll speak to this, and then I'll hand it back off to Paul relating to that. Um, it, it, the TCPA does uh, address not just cell phone numbers, but, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, FCC has interpreted calls the cell phone numbers to include text. Um, it also addresses pre-recorded voicemails or messaging, um, including to a landline. Um, so you, you have to be concerned with that. Now, there, there's another issue that comes up and there's been one case from 2019 in the first circuit um, relating to voice over IP. So, and, and this is becoming more of an issue with COVID and that as people have moved out of their office um, into their home office, like me, <laughs> as you can see from the background, um, you know, I, I, you know, signed up for a voice over IP service. I have um, the app on my cell phone and um, I ported you know, a number I use from another service over to this voice over IP service. What was really interesting in this first case, first circuit court case that uh, was issued in 2019 is one, um, you know, there's not a lot of clarity from the FCC on the issue of whether um, voice over IP lines that are associated with an app on a phone constitute a cellular telephone service. And um, so, um, and, and remember, at its basic element, the TCPA is a consumer related law, which the reason for bringing that up is that means that it's generally interpreted broadly to the benefit of the consumer. Now, we're talking now in the context of B2B sales, but um, it can translate into that. And so this First Circuit Court case said, even though Newstar had listed the hybrid voice over IP line, as a landline, okay, and they actually made a mistake in that listing. The fact that the um, the person being called who who felt like they were violated, it was a violation of the TCPA. The fact that the call could be made either voice over IP or if there was no Wi-Fi connection to the phone, then it diverted over or converted over to a cellular telephone call meant that that did constitute a TCPA violation. So um, it can get tricky. I mean, many of you might have, you know, a scrubbing service, for lack of a better term, to make sure the calls you're making outbound are to landlines. But at least in this case, in the First Circuit, there was a mistake in that listing, which meant there still was a TCPA violation. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back off to Paul if he has anything else to add on the uh, scope of uh, TCPA as it relates to something, I, you know, technology beyond just cell, traditional telephones or cell phone service. Yeah, I, I think I think you really um, pointed out a, a, a good caveat there with the VoIP. It, it, one thing as well is just pre-recorded messages. The, those can get very tricky to navigate when we're talking about does it apply to business to business calls? Um, and if so, is it, are we talking landlines, cell phones? So um, really, I, I would be cautious to take that mindset of by only or, or by only calling landlines, I don't need to worry about the TCPA. There's, there's a lot of other factors to go into. Now, Paul, in your practice, uh, you run across some uh, you know, cases that may not be published or, um, you know, you're aware of certain settlements. Um, can you give us kind of a high level without disclosing names of uh, some B2B uh, cases you've run across where there's uh, been settlements? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's plenty of them out there. Um, and, and, and so one, uh, there's a water filtration company that was auto dialing people to not only sell their products, but asking them to become distributors for their company. Um, 
So they they resulted uh, or that resulted in a class action settlement of 22 million. Um, a prominent ride share company out there was sending uh, automated text messages to to people to sign up uh, to to become a driver uh, for their company. Uh, 20 million class action. A uh, home service repair company was advertising to businesses uh, via via text messages. Um, they didn't have the proper consent in place. They settled for a, a few million because they wanted to. Uh, they they try to get people uh, or other businesses to to get on their platform, and that platform would allow uh, uh, them to be to increase notoriety through their through their mobile app. Um, another app company was sending automated messages to businesses to try and get them on their platform. Uh, they were doing so to, to to cell phones without the proper consent. Um, Again, uh, the, this list goes on and on. It, it, it's the the main thing to be can uh, to consider is contacting cell phones and make sure that you are doing it manually. Um, when you're doing it from an automated perspective, in my in in my experience, I don't, I don't see a lot of companies who are doing business to business calls or texts obtaining the proper level of consent to use an automated system. Thank you, Paul. So we, we've talked about TCPA and the fact that it's a federal uh, piece of legislation. Are there any state roles that we need to be concerned with for uh, B2B calls? Yes, there, there certainly are. So um, there are state do not call lists uh, that, or I'll, I'll back up. There's a national do not call list that, that is meant for consumers. Um, there are 12 states that have their own separate uh, do not call list as well. Um, Pennsylvania and Mississippi actually allow businesses to put their phone numbers on there. So what that means is if you're calling a Pennsylvania or a Mississippi based business and you don't have any sort of relationship or exemption to call them, we can't call them at all if they're on that list. So we need, need to be checking against that list. Um, there was another uh, court case where uh, it, in Colorado, calling home-based businesses was considered uh, basically off limits uh, because that home-based business had put their home phone number uh, on the do not call list. And without an exemption, we can't call them as well. Uh, there's the, a, a call recording disclosure. Uh, that, that's another state rule that would apply for uh, business to business calls. So, Hey, uh, my name's Paul. I'm, I, I'm calling on a recorded line with, with suffice. Um, there are 10 states that require companies uh, when they're making business to business sales calls to honor a do not call request made directly to that company. So what that means is if you were to call uh, a company within one of these states um, and they say, stop calling me, you've called me enough, or I, I'm, I'm not interested and, and, I, and in fact, uh, place me on your do not call list. We've got to honor that. Um, even though there's only 10 states that technically requirement, I always recommend just honor it across the board. I mean, what, what are the odds that uh, someone who says stop calling me is going to down the road uh, purchase from your company? Um, so, uh, yeah, there are plenty of, of state rules that come into place on top of the TCPA uh, that companies should be concerned with when placing business to business calls. Thank you, Paul. So, you know, when sales leaders are formulating their strategy for um, their marketing campaigns and uh, outbound callings and, and texting is uh, part of that, um, and they're looking at companies that provide solutions with or without agent-assisted dialing, what are some of the questions those companies uh, should be asking their vendor about TCPA compliance? There are plenty of questions that you should be asking your vendors about TCPA compliance. Um, so for one, as I or, or just kind of pointed out earlier in this presentation, remember that third parties acting on, on your company's behalf can create liability for your company. Um, it's called vicarious liability. So one set of questions to be, it, it is really uh, for third parties, is, is, is how do they comply with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act? Um, 
But more specifically, if we're talking about uh, dialing companies, um, so we're, we're evaluating a, a new dialer, um, and, and we want to know how this dialer is going to keep us compliant. Um, there, are, there are some specific questions you can ask. One is, if you're looking for a manual dialer, uh, ask the dialing company if they have any sort of third-party opinion. Uh, there, there are plenty of companies out there uh, that create and, and, and vet these companies, these dialing companies, um, and provide just an unbiased third-party opinion uh, as to why it is a manual platform and not an automated system. Uh, how do they manage opt-outs? So if, if you've got a dialer uh, that you're vetting and you want to make sure that, that they can honor do not call requests in a, in a timely manner, uh, ask them how it's performed. Uh, ask them to walk, walk through a screen share. Is, is it easy to do? Is it in real time? Most dialer companies are in real time. It, it would be a bit concerning to me if um, a modern day dialing solution would take days to, to honor an opt out. Um, when it comes to, to record keeping, uh, ask your, your dialing company, uh, how long do they keep your dialing records? Uh, who's responsible for, for obtaining them uh, after a certain period of time? So say they keep it for 30 days. Uh, what do they do at, at, on day 31? Are they deleting them? Are they putting them in a, in a data warehouse that you can access later? Uh, or do you need to get them on, on day 30? Uh, remember, record keeping is everything when it comes to creating a defense. So uh, make sure, and I see this a lot, it's a common pitfall. If, if your dialing company is only keeping records uh, of the calls or the text that you have placed for a certain period of time, make sure you're getting those records um, before they get deleted. And then also make sure in your contract that you've got some sort of uh, transfer of those records if the relationship is terminated for any reason. Um, and I'll, I'll keep going with some other questions. Uh, if, if you want to, if you want to call at, at between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., for example, well, how does how does that dialing company determine the location of who you're calling? Is it off of the address of that business? Is it off of the the area code on that phone number, um, I'd recommend address. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, cell phone mobility uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, so someone uh, with, a, with a, a Georgia phone number uh, located in, in California, uh, we're not going to want to call them at 8 a.m. Georgia time. We're, we're going to want to go off of the address of their business, not the area code of their phone number, so, so that we're not waking them up at, at say, 5 or 6 a.m. Um, and then it, one other one that comes to mind is what, what do they put on caller ID? Can they display a name? Uh, or is it only a phone number? If you're wanting to display a name, most modern dialing solutions can display a name, uh, and we're going to want to have them push that to the uh, telecom carriers. Um, so really it's just, Ask yourself when it comes to the to the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, to state rules, or, or even to your business rules, uh, how does the dialer fit in? And ask your dialing company uh, for for a presentation or a screen share uh, brochures of of how they comply with what they say they're going to comply with. Thank you. I mean, to amplify that a little bit. Um, there was a case up in New York that was interesting to me in that um, a, a person who had visited a nightclub, now this is outside the B2B context, but it could apply to a B2B situation where uh, the, the nightclub sent, it, it had a human tee up like 50 email or text messages to be sent at a, at a prescribed time. And so the issue came down to was there human intervention for those batch of texts to where it didn't constitute auto auto dialing or an ATDS? And um, you know, then you've got the issue with uh, companies, you know, dialing out of their CRM of uh, setting up a predefined list of numbers to call. And um, and and so, in your experience, Paul. Um, are you navigating out of the scope of TCPA if a 
if a dialer has to click, even if it's from a predefined sorted list that's been prearranged, um, you know, if they initiate each call individually, uh, does that take you out of the scope of uh, TCPA where you could, in that in instance, call a cell phone without worrying about um, violating the TCPA? Yeah, so dialing a list of phone numbers, even, even if manually, I think in general it is still going to be okay. What we want to uh, what we want to to assert is that we're not sequentially dialing a list of phone numbers, even if it is manually. Um, so that that means you know dialing one two three four one two three five one two three six. We don't we don't want to do that. We want to we want to outline the fact that there is certain business logic um, used to select the. Uh, the next record to dial. So is it um, the amount of debt owed? Do we want to sort it by that? Is it by the number of attempts? We want to start with, at, at zero attempts and then go to one attempt to, is it, is it by uh, time zone? Um, and, and by doing so, we can, we can build this argument in defense that we're not sequentially dialing from a list of phone numbers. Thank you. And, and one point to make before we get to questions, um, you know, when the when the TCPA was first passed by Congress in 1991, it was not uncommon for robocallers to randomly generate numbers. And so the definition of APDS, you know, used that random or sequential number uh, generation or storage in its definition. That definition has never been amended, okay? Then you might be aware of the Supreme Court case last month where, uh, the Congress's amendment to the TCPA to permit government collection calls or, or collection calls relating to U.S. government debt, which would mainly be tax debt or uh, student loan debt. Um, you know, so th there's some interesting cases where the question arose, well, if, if the TCPA scope is not intended to include predefined lists, then why did Congress need to amend to provide for collection calls? Because you don't, when you're making a collection call, you're not randomly calling numbers until you happen to get somebody on the phone that, you, you know, owes you money. <laughs> okay, you're calling, you know who you're calling. So, so the takeaway from that is, is that predefined lists, even though they're not randomly generated, um, you know, where you're just calling, you know, every number sequentially, um, off of an NNX, um, you know, predefined lists are included in, uh, uh, or calling from predefined lists are included in the scope of TCPA, uh, with the trap being if a number in that, in that list is to a cell phone. Um, with that, I'll hand it back to Mary to uh, facilitate questions from our, our audience today. Great. Thanks, guys. We are going to talk about one of the questions that came in is, if we are using a dial service that we are manually leaving voicemails, then hit dial next number, then repeat the process to K through 12 school districts, would this be a violation? So they're using a dial service, they're manually leaving voicemails and then hit dial next number. Is that a violation? I mean, my, uh, oh. I'll go ahead, Paul. Sure. Um, it, it, again, this comes down to capacity. Um, so if you're if you're utilizing a system that can only dial next record, leave voicemail, dial next record, leave voicemail, that's all it can do, then odds are it's a manual system. Uh, if it can do anything, it, remember, it's capacity. So can the dialer manager uh, – flip a switch in the background uh, or in their management dashboard to, to change that type of dialing mode that you just illustrated. If they can, uh, and they can do that to an automated, in an automated fashion, then uh, there may be some TCPA concerns. Go ahead, Mike. Well, okay, so I, and I, when I first read that question, I think I was misinterpreting it. So there's no pre-recorded voicemail. You're manually leaving the voicemail. Yes. And then, and then hitting dial next you're number. You're mm -hmm. manually hitting dial next number. So you've, you've got a human intervention on each and every 
call in the process. That that would seem to, and without additional facts, uh, that would seem to navigate outside the scope of TCPA. Let's go on to the next question then. If a cell phone owner says to stop calling them, can I still text them? Well, actually, our, our questioner, you know, if, if said it does have the option to use an automated voicemail. I think this goes to Paul's point. So it could lead to a TCPA violation. So absolutely, that's that, that's the problem with this capacity word in the definition of ATDS is whether you use that capability or not, there's plenty of cases in the last few years that said because it had that capacity to leave a pre-recorded call you're within the scope of TCPA. So um, yeah, thanks for that additional clarification, John. You go ahead, Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, let's move back to that question. If a cell phone owner says to stop calling them, can I still text them? Um, a very, very common question that, that I receive for sure. Um, and the answer is no, uh, as, as Mike had pointed out, um, a call and a text under the TCPA are, are to be treated as one and the same. So we can't call somebody, they say, hey, stop calling me, and then turn around and text them. Uh, it's just, one, it goes against the, the spirit of, of, of a do not call request, right? Someone saying, stop calling me. Uh, and then uh, two, yeah, the, the TCPA has said that because calls and texts are treated as one and the same, um, therefore, if someone opts out from your company, whether it's from a call or a text, they should be both opt out should occur, regardless if they made the opt out through the call or through the texts. You know, and what's been interesting is uh, the FCC interpretation of, um, you know, to handle number portability is extremely narrow. So this, this prior express written consent you may have that from an individual and you have their phone number. And then, you know, the facts are such that, you know, maybe a month or two later after they've given that consent, they um, change that phone number and somebody else new gets that phone number that was associated with the prior written consent. You have a very short time period. And uh, I can't, I don't know off the top of my head, but it, it's, I remember it being a month or less and maybe one or two calls where you get a get out of jail free card, so to speak, on a, a number of portability. But if you then call that person after that 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 uh, that time period, and, and you had the prior written consent associated with that number, then um, it, it won't count. You you'll be uh, it'll constitute you calling somebody who did not provide prior written consent, so that. That's something to be careful about. Okay, Mary, I'll hand it We back. have one last question. Are there any companies, businesses that are considered exempt from TCPA? Yeah, there, there are. And before I answer that, to Mike's point about reassigned numbers and, and, and ported numbers, um, one stat to keep in mind is uh, it's 100,000 phone numbers are changed daily. So even if we're calling what we think is a landline, it may have been ported to a cell phone um, or it may have been passed along to a different person. Uh, and it's happening at, at a very uh, fast frequency and, and it's occurring often. Um, but Mary, back to, uh, to, to the, the question. Um, there are certain, certain companies or, or certain companies that engage in um, specific types of calls that are exempt from the uh, the TCPA. Uh, certain nonprofit organizations uh, could could either find themselves uh, partially exempt or, or fully exempt depending on uh, their their activities. Uh, there are some some healthcare uh, companies out there that would be exempt, but they've got to fall under very certain uh, parameters or are they, are they calling for very specific reasons? And then, uh, it, you know, if there's a company that it, that's calling only for emergency purposes, so uh, perhaps uh, a company is responsible for letting company or letting uh, people know that there's a recall or a warranty or some something that is immediately uh, impactful to their health. 
um, they may fall under uh, an outright exemption to the TCPA. So there are there are a few, but in large part, um, it, most companies are subject to the TCPA, and if there's sales involved, um, then almost certainly they're they're going to all be covered by the TCPA. Mike, anything that you want to add to that? No, I think I'm good on that one. Uh, Perfect. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. And thank you to our attendees. And we hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Thank you.